All right, I am now joined by a very, very special two-time recurring guest, longtime friend of the podcast. It is Cincinnati Reds relief pitcher TJ Antone. Uh, it's been about two years since you've been back on the pod. It's really great to see you live from Cincinnati, TJ. How, how's everything going first? We'll start there. Yeah, it has been about two years. I remember I think I did the first podcast at my uh, house uh, back in Fort Worth. And uh, yeah, it, we I think we did it with Brian too. So we, yeah, it was a, it was a three-person podcast. But yeah, it's been great. Um, you know, I, I went down with a elbow injury this year, so I was able to step away from the game a little bit and, um, you know, kind of focus on my business and focus on myself. And so it's been good so far. Now I'm back in Cincinnati. I got a little checkup from Crim Check. Everything's going really well. He likes how it's progressing. It feels really good. So, you know, keep getting those check marks, keep moving forward and, and, uh, keep progressing. And, you know, hopefully next year I'll be, you know, back playing and get an opportunity in the big leagues again. That's where I wanted to start. It's just like where you were at in your rehab process. So when, when did you have the third surgery and where are you at kind of timeline wise? Yeah. So went to kind of uh, march into like where I was going into spring training. So at the end of last year, I made it back from my second Tommy John surgery. I had a little bit of um, inflammation that just kind of crept on me up on me at the end of the season. They wanted to like keep a precaution. It was cool though, to like make it back to the big leagues after it had been two years since, um, since I had pitched in the big leagues. So I made it back. I was doing really well. I had like a one, eight ERA, you know, I mean, under my, you know, six or seven innings that I had, um, but I was doing well and, um, you know, some inflammation crept up, they ended up shutting me down and, um, I got an injection and went to the off season and I was just like, okay. Um, you know, my biggest focus going into this off season is just like get healthy. Right. Like I want to do a full season. And so I went, you know, I marched away at, um, with a plan and then followed the plan all off season. I felt good and, you know, I have good days and bad days. You have two surgeries and, you know, it just, it's going to happen. Sometimes you have a bad day. So, um, but went into spring training, like feeling pretty good. I was low nineties with the understanding of, you know, I, at that point, I was under the impression that I was automatically on the team. Like I didn't really have to like earn my position um, in spring training. And then that quickly got uh, adjusted and they were like, hey, you're on the chopping block of not making the team. And I was like, oh, OK, like I'm talking the time to step on the gas. So I started throwing a little bit harder, um, you know, made the team out of camp, which was a huge success, um, you know, especially after two surgeries. And then I went into season. And, uh, it was like early April, um, uh, my first outing, I didn't do that great. Second outing I did, I faced the Phillies and, uh, faced Bryce Harper in the 10th inning, punched him out to win the game. Uh, so like I had some good success there, like right at the end, I had another inning, another inning, I think it was against the Mets. Um, and so like everything seemed to be coming, coming along. I felt pretty good. I was recovering. Okay. Um, knew it was like early in the season, but like, wasn't super concerned about like, you know, hurting or anything like that. It was just like, Oh, it's early in the season. I'm like kind of getting back in the swing of things. Like I'm going to have some soreness here and there and, you know, went out for a game. I felt really good in the bullpen. I felt really good on the game mound. And then the very first pitch I threw uh, on the game mound, uh, my elbow popped and I had a full flexor tear. It was like April, April 7th, I believe um, really early in the season. You know, I, I, I felt really good. And then I, but it was the very first pitch I threw, I threw a sinker inside and Elbow pop, full flexor tear, tore off the UCL, um, off the bone. Uh, Dr. Krimchak did my surgery again. So that was, that'd be my third elbow surgery. Um, he was a little bit more optimistic with the flexor being completely torn off of the bone versus just like a partial tear, because then you can kind of go in and, and repair the whole thing versus trying to do like a, like a stitch, which is what happened the second time, which is why I think it failed the second time is it was, uh, there was like a, I had a partial tear on the second surgery. So I think he went in and did like a stitch. I don't know if the stitch like held. So this time he went in, um, had to fully anchor it down. So he used, I would believe it was like nine anchors to anchor the flexor back down to the bone. He put the UCL back down on the bone and then also added an internal brace uh, to that. So at this point, my elbows are pretty much like a cyborg. Uh, I got like a, you know, a robotic elbow. Um, so ho hopefully everything stays together at this point. It does feel really good. I'm really happy with how it's progressing. And, uh, you know, doc, doc wants to go really slow with this one. And I respect that. So, you know, it might take a little bit longer than like the typical Tommy John. Um, uh, but you know, that being said, it is my third elbow surgery. So I completely understand of why, but being an athlete, it's hard to, to pull the reins on yourself. Cause you want to go, go, go. But that also could have been the issue the whole time of me trying to go and the body saying, Hey, we're not ready yet. So that's where I'm at. 
that's that's I know you're I know you're a super competitive guy and how hard is it to to like you said to not rush yourself back and not try to get back onto the mound faster because I'm sure there has there's this whole process involved like you said you're working with your doctor like is that hard to like you said take your you know let off the reins a little bit yeah because you have like in Tommy John there's a typical timeline for everything it's like oh at four months you can start doing this and at six months you can start doing this and I'm not allowed to follow that timeline I have to go slower than that and I think that's what's hard about it is like I don't it's not necessarily that I want to like go faster than what the timeline says. It's just that I, I want to follow the timeline and doc doesn't want to follow the timeline. So I have to respect that. And I also have to respect my body. Like he wants it to be really solid in there. And so it's like, okay, like, I guess, you know, time will heal more. And so if we don't rush through some of these phases, then we have like a little bit extra weeks here and a couple of extra weeks there to kind of like let the tissue quality like continue to mold and change and grow and and heal um as we go through these phases so it's it is hard as a professional athlete because especially when um you know contract talks start coming around and you want to be in a position where you're throwing and and you're you can tell the team or tell any team hey i feel good like you know i have a i have like a chance to throw next year and you know this may push me back you know past that so uh, you know, for me, I just got to let go and let God and and let him kind of just like dictate my path. And, you know, for me, it's, it's hard. It's very hard to do that sometimes because you want to being the professional athlete through hard work and perseverance, you see yourself get to the major leagues and you want to continue that hard work and kind of make it happen for yourself again. And sometimes you have to like pull back on the reins and say, okay, like, we'll just, we'll just take it, take it easy here and uh, listen to the body and, and take it a little bit slower. There's also like a lot of factors outside of your control too in a lot of these situations. Like I was reading about Clayton Kershaw, who's, you know, dealt with a lot of injuries lately. And he looked and he saw all the injuries the Dodgers had. And he's like, well, they could really use me back. So he kind of like pushed his rehab up a little bit and didn't give himself as much ramp up time. Like that, how common is that for guys to like put the team in the team first or like, I'm going to, I'm going to push it back because the guys need me. I feel like that's got to be like, I feel like everybody has to do that. Yeah. It's very common. I would say like, you know, I've seen a couple of Reds players um, and I'm not going to name any names, but like who maybe got injured or a little banged up and they're trying to rush back and they'll literally say something like, well, the team needs me or like, Oh, we're down a reliever or something like that. And it's like, that's just the way you grow up. Like baseball is a team sport. You want to be there for your boys. You know, you want everyone to be successful. And sometimes that means you have to wear a little bit of the load and like guys want to do that for their, for the teams. It helps build camaraderie it helps build that trust and like especially like when it works out when guys see you like hey i'm gonna i'm doing the extra for you guys and you wear it on your back like guys love that you know guys feed off that and then they do better and then they you know like it can feed and it can really get the train the chain sorry the train churning a little bit right and everyone's kind of pulling in the same direction and doing the extra um, but it also can, the risk of it is, you know, re-injuring yourself and you try to rush it one week and now you're back three and, and yeah, it, it can, it can definitely go either direction in that, in that sense. I, I know you talk, I think even on the last podcast about just like wanting to use the the injury recovery and everything you've been going through as like a, a beacon for other people of light and trying to give, you know, people who are going through similar situations, something to look up to. How much pride do you take in the work that you, you've done for that? And like, did you ever think you would know as much about elbows and tendons as you do now? Yeah. Yeah. I feel I, I joke that I'm a medical professional at elbows at this point. <laughs> I know them pretty well. Um, I'm definitely not a medical professional. And, but yeah, like I, I really do think it's important to, um, to, to be optimistic and to use your situation um, as a light for others and, you know, as a, platform of optimism for others because you know other guys are going through it and they could be dealing with way less where it's like hey i injured myself my senior year of high school and now i can't play in college or you know but it's like well what if you took a gap year and then played in college after that like don't i don't want people to just shut the door on themselves and give up on life just because something bad happened i think that happens to a lot of people um i hear countless people walk up to me like well i used to play baseball but i got injured you know and then that's like the end of their story and it's like yeah i understand that some people don't have the medical attention uh that's needed to return from an injury but, you know, with with Instagram and with, you know, the vast amount of knowledge that you can get through Instagram, that's what I'm trying to leverage a little bit. So show off my workouts, some of the workouts that I'm doing where kids can get ideas of how to 
you know, level up their, their training program. You know, I try to put some like educational content around like how to, you know, uh, best flexor exercises and, you know, just stuff like that. So I'm always trying to like learn what people want. Right. And then also kind of use my situation and my, the education that I have of myself to try to help others. Right. And I know other, everyone's not like that, but that's just kind of, that's me. I want to, I want to make sure I'm doing the best for others. And and I think it helps me with my mentality because if I'm very focused on myself, I get selfish and, and I get kind of in the dumps and then I'm like, all oh, just focus on myself when I'm able to like take where I'm at and help others. It helps me not look at myself as much and, you know, start to, you know, give to others. And, and it really helps with my mentality. I've noticed. It's such a cool thing you're doing. Just like, yeah, sharing your, your vast wealth of knowledge and trying to help people along the way. Um, and, and just like the mental side of all of this stuff, it, 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 I know it's extremely hard and I know there's a lot of, you know, probably some down days, but um, I had a question about how you've kind of dealt with the mental side of this stuff. It's actually the morning baseball question, 10% and off using promo code BATS10, morningbaseball.com. Um, what was the moment where your mindset shifted to this one of kind of like the positivity mindset you just talked about? And, and do you do any mindfulness work to maintain that or how do you kind of manage the mental load of what's going on? Yeah, I don't to, to, to try to put my finger on an exact moment. Um, I feel like it was kind of after my first surgery and I noticed just the ability, like my ability to learn in that moment. what I, I had no clue really what was going on. My first surgery was in 2017. I was a minor leaguer. I was making no money. Um, I was, I had a roommate, his name was Jeremy Kibble and I can and talk more about him in a second, but uh, me and Jeremy just like asked a lot of questions was like, well, why did we get injured? And, and was it our mechanics or was it the strength and was it this and that? And I think when we started to ask all these questions and we started to understand like, you know, what all goes into it and how, how in depth an injury actually goes. It's not just one thing. It's like multiple things that, that go into it and force and, and stress and, um, and, you know, like your preparation and, and all these different things that go into it. Um, and then being able to just share some of that knowledge with other guys who were like kind of, you know, even just a few months behind us in the rehab process, be like, Oh, this is what I learned when I was in my second month. Like this is what I did and seeing them kind of use that information to, to, you know, level up or to grow from that. Um, I think that like really inspired me to, you know, want to like do more for others and not have it be so focused on myself. Um, and then now Jeremy Kibble has used his knowledge. He's the rehab pitching coach for the New York Mets. He's my business partner at Cova Sports. Um, so that's a baseball training facility in Texas that, you know, we both own. And like, it's been cool to watch him go from, I had surgery, my career's over to now like owning a business. And now he's working for the New York Mets. Right. And then it's just been really cool. I think when you have that outward approach of helping others and, and that is your focus, you know, people, they feed off that, you know, and it's not a selfish thing in the end. It's not like, oh, I'm going to help others so that I get more on the backside. I think it's just a natural consequence of trying to help others. Like you, you end up being blessed on the backside. And like for the mentality wise, like for me, I'm a, I'm huge on my religion. I'm Christian. Um, I'm talking with Jesus daily. Like that is like a mainstay in my life. I want to make sure that I'm representing him well and that I'm learning and growing and making adjustments. Um, you know, just to look back at, at where I was, like when I first got drafted, how I was like cocky and selfish and one of the best for myself to where I am now, like I've made leaps and bounds. And I think it's because I've tried my best to like learn from situations and like just ask God to like mold my heart to his. And I think like, no, I'm nowhere near perfect. Like I still make mistakes. And like, I think that's fine, you know, we're, that we're all like that, but you know, I think it's more about the progress than necessarily the goal. So it's like, that's what I want. You know, if someone has like mentality issues, it's like, you know, taking those daily steps of just like trying to learn from whatever happened or whatever pissed you off or whatever's happening at your job. It's like, how do I, you know, who, who do I go to? Okay, like for me, it's Jesus and, and my prayer, my daily walk and like reading the Bible. So that's, that's what, that's uh, my mentality, at least how I use, uh, you know, mental work. Love that dude. That's so, that's so awesome. I I've seen a, like, so pitching arm injuries, it's there. It's every time I feel like you look at the baseball news, I feel like there's somebody else going down. I've, I've like read quotes from other guys around the industry that said, it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when they happen, which seems kind of bleak and kind of down. Um, like, have you like, has that just like the overarching theme for a lot of these things? It's just like, you know, is, is there a lot of negativity going around with like the, in terms of pitching arm injuries right now? 
Um, I think it is definitely becoming like a more of a, like a normal thing. Unfortunately, you know, we want to stop it. We, there's really, it, it just hasn't seemed to be slowing down at all. And if anything, it's been seeming to be speeding up. Um, there's been so many arm injuries. Uh, so many guys have, have had season ending injuries, whether it be shoulder or elbow, um, you know, I, I understand like the saying, if it's not a matter of if, but when I think, you know, a lot of that pertains to like a guy's uh, phys physiological makeup. You know, I think some guys just have arms that are built to throw baseball. And I think some guys just don't. And, you know, sometimes that is an accumulation of workload over years and years and years. Cause I never had any arm issues until I got to minor league baseball, you know, so professional sports and some guys tear their UCL when they're in high school. And so it's like, what's the difference there? You know, I, th I think a lot of that is like, you know, your body and what how, the way you have it built up. Um, I think in professional sports, there's a lot of workload management issues that are that are probably the most prevalent issues. Um, I also think there's a little bit of a bad rap around, um, you know, speaking the truth about how you're feeling. Um, if that makes sense, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of guys will be banged up, don't want to say anything to the coaching staff. Um, you know, so they hide it, hide it, hide it. And then all of a sudden it shows up and like, they have a, you know, a tear in the rotator cuff or a sprained UCL. Right. And that's how it starts. Right. Then that tissue quality is, is a little bit, a little, you know, deteriorated or a little bit, you know, worse. And then you try to rehab it. And sometimes rehab works really well, but um, sometimes, you know, you rush it back and like, you think you feel good, but you know, it's just like this game that you're playing, right. You, you kind of like get into your head where um, you, you kind of get used to the pain and that sounds terrible, but you just like, you throw and you're just used to it. And this is just what it feels like. And then you get numb to it and then like it, it gets worse. And then that's when something bad happens. And so then when you return and you're kind of used to and numb to this pain that you've been throwing with, you think it feels good. But in reality, you still have a little bit of underlying issues that you're just kind of dealing with uh, or like masking from yourself. So I think the the brain plays a, a very large role in, um, you know, pain management. And I think also something that's not spoken about a lot is like outside field, outside of the field of stresses. Uh, whether that be, you know, family or sleep or uh, business or, you know, whatever it may be, like, am I going to get moved down to AAA? Am I going to get moved up to the big leagues? Like the stresses of life, uh, stress is stress. Like that is related to your body and to your nervous system. And I think that can cause or can can cause uh, a regulation of your nervous system to be either downregulated or upregulated, uh, which can cause injuries as well. Yeah. I had a question about velocity, which I think also kind of plays a role in some of this stuff. As a pitcher, how hard is it knowing that velocity is what's going to get you noticed? It's what it get, it's going to get you moved up, but it's also the thing that might end up making you miss time. Is that a hard thing to wrap your mind around in terms of velo? Um, so I've seen guys throw as slow as 78 miles an hour, tear their UCL. And I've seen guys throw 103 and not tear their UCL. So while technically, yes, the amount of stress does increase on your elbow as you throw harder, uh, it's not necessarily a correlation or a causation of throwing harder makes causes injury. So I, I don't think it should deterior or like deter anyone from trying to throw harder. I think if, if baseball is your passion and you want to pursue the highest level of baseball, you have to throw hard and you need to chase that dream and you need to find a coach to help you um, you know, help you navigate that because I don't think someone can do it alone. I think you need outside sources to help you kind of like your drilling and your programming and your strength training. I think all of that um, is definitely important in, in your, you know, in the process of chasing velocity. And so, but yeah, I don't think that velocity necessarily is the causation or correlation between, uh, I think there is higher stresses and throwing harder, but there are ways to mitigate or, you know, kind of, move the forces, uh, transverse the forces amongst your body instead of having it load just on your elbow. Interesting. Uh, I had a question about just like trying to improve your velocity because I know for me, I'm training for a marathon. I love the feeling of getting better at something. Is that the way it kind of works for pitchers and throwing harder? Like, is it addicting to see like the radar gun and have that be, you know, kind of what drives you in a lot of these things? Yeah, absolutely. And just the ability to like post that on Instagram and get the, the gratification from it, you know, like you're running a marathon and you run 
you shave off five minutes, you know, off of your time and you're like, Whoa, like, how did that happen? And it's just like the, you know, the undulating of programs. Cause I'm sure some days you run three miles and then some days you'll run 16 miles. And then like, you just do that and you follow a program and then all of a sudden you run your marathon and it was like easier than the last one. So it's the same, can't same kind of concept. Um, and in baseball, you know, you, you have days where you have like recovery days, you're throwing softer, you're working on your movement uh, efficiency, and then you have days where you're going to ramp up, throw as hard as you can. And you kind of have this like undulating uh, super compensation uh, program where it's like you kind of break yourself down, the body builds back up stronger, you throw harder, you get like the reward, like the dopamine dump. And then, uh, you know, it's just like it's a chase, it's a dream. But then at this point, like in my career, I'm 30 years old. Um, I've done that. I've done that velocity chase and it got me to the big leagues. And it's like, now I just need to be at a certain level. So I don't, I don't necessarily continue to chase. I'm not like, I want to throw 105 now. Like I've thrown hundred in the big leagues. I've done that. Um, don't get me wrong. It's like gets outs. It gets outs pretty easily too. But you know, I also know I can get out to like 93, 96. So like, that's a really good range for me. I know I'm really effective there. My ball moves really well there. So I don't know. I don't necessarily need the 98s for myself anymore, but I do think for the younger generation, you got to throw hard to get noticed. What was that feeling like when you hit triple digits for the first time? Sick. Yeah. Nomar uh, Narvaez punched him out. It was pretty cool. 100.7, I believe. Ooh, was that the top that you, you got to? That was the hardest ball I've ever thrown, yeah. Yeah. Did, did you turn around? Did you have a moment to like look look at like the radar thing on the screen? You're just like, I did it? So in baseball, like the, I threw a hundred before in Arizona and I was, I let that thing go and I was like, that felt so good. And I turned and looked at the board and it said a hundred and I was like, yeah, let's go. And I went to the dugout and there's another kind of like in baseball or at least in the major leagues, there's like another, uh, tracking device, you know, I, then it was a track man, but now it's Hawkeye. And so no one really lets you say that you threw that hard unless it says it on hawkeye which is like a way more accurate tracking device i think sometimes the stadium radar guns might be like juiced a little bit like a mile an hour or two just for fans you know you throw 98 and it says 100 like fans are gonna be like whoa you know yep. in reality like it doesn't really matter what the hitter sees so like you know when i went in and looked at the track man on in arizona it said like 99.8 or something so i didn't hit 100 like you can't round up um, so I knew it was like I, on my list, I was like, I still got to do this. Like, I didn't even know I was going to have the ability to do that until I did it. And I was like, Oh, I can do this. So it was cool to like have that mental barrier break for me. And then, um, and then, you know, go out and achieve it later on in the season. It's a big deal. I, I don't know what the percent, it can't be a, a large percentage of pitchers that have, have been able to do that in the big leagues, but to be one of the people that have seen, yeah, triple digits on the big board. Yeah. That's so you, you mentioned that after being able to throw a hundred after some of the arm stuff, you you're able to get guys out at 93 to 96. What, what was, was there like a mental barrier to like figure out how to, did you have to relearn how to become a pitcher? Or did you have to become more of like command based? How did you kind of shift from blow, blowing it by guys to trying to work it around them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're kind of always learning that. Um, it's a day-to-day -day process. It's a year-to-year -year process, season to season. It's month to month sometimes too. Um, you you figure out what works and then you go out there and you punch the side and you're like, that was sick. And then you go out there and try and do the same thing and you get three homers hit off you. And you're like, what just happened? You know, when you make adjustments and you change it a little bit. So yeah, it's like an ever revolving process uh, as of pitching. And, and I think that um, it really came down to like me and my paint threshold and like that, those velocity numbers felt kind of most comfortable for me. And then like trying to reach back and go more and more and more just like, didn't really feel more comfortable for me. So I just like, was like, this is where I'm going to have to be at. And like, it's not really going to get higher than that because I just can't. Do you enjoy the, the mental chess match of facing a batter? I, I saw a clip of, it was like Greg Maddox and Barry Bonds going over an old at bat. And them just like talking about through the thought process. It was the coolest thing ever. Do you enjoy that part of the game? Yeah, it's sick. It's like the best part of the game. Um, it's, it's, uh, I've been more tired after one inning of work before because I've had to think through so many different situations and, and analyzing the way the guy took a pitch or the way the guy fouled off a ball and then understanding like 
where I just threw it and what should I throw next? And what's, what's the situation? Oh, there's a guy on second. Now there's one out. Who's up? Oh no, no, not who's up. You know, it's like running through the checklist in your head and then like also running it against like, how do you feel? What pitch is working for you that day? And it's like, just kind of like your mind, is just like hundred miles an hour. Then taking that deep breath and just committing to what you chose. Um, it, it's fun, but it's also very like, like mm. mentally exhausting for sure. What was it like pre and post uh, pitch clock trying to do that? Because I'm sure w- before the pitch clock, you had more time to be able to think through these things. Now you're on a clock trying to do it. What what was that change like? Yeah, I think that's really all it came down to. It was like, if you needed those extra moments of just like, let me really think through this situation before I throw this ball. Um, you, you had that a lot of time before then. Now it's like, nope, let's go. There's five seconds left. You got to come set, you know? So um, you really got to just like, make a decision and commit to it. And sometimes, you know, the decisions, you just trust the catcher and like he, he, you have the pitch calm now and uh, he calls curveball or he calls fastball and you're just like, yep, like, let's go with it. Like, I trust you and just put the glove down. I'll throw it right there, you know? And so, so that's where, you know, your, your catcher comes in and, and helps you a lot with the decision-making as the really good defensive coordinator for the, for the field and for the pitcher. So yeah, you just got to trust them. If you, if you don't have the moments to like do the decision-making yourself, you just trust the catcher and you go for it. Yeah. What, what's been your, your favorite battle you've had with, with, uh, with, with a batter? Mm, that's a good question. Um, no, no one are not as really good. Um, Bryce Harper is fun to face. I faced him, punched him out. Thanks. Um, trying to think who else. Oh, um, Arias. Yeah. He was really fun to face. Also punched him out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of guys out there that are just really, they're tough outs and they have really good bat to ball skill. And I think that they're balanced on their swing. And uh, I think that those are a couple of things that are a little bit tougher you know, as a pitcher, it's like, dang, I can't get him off balance. Like I can't speed him up, slow him down. I can't get him to like lean over. Cause in reality, you're, you, we all want swing and misses, but if you can just get him to miss hit the ball, you win, you know? So, um, you know, even just a, the slightest bit of like bending at the waist to get him out front or whatever it may be, you know, those hitters are really good and it's really cool to watch them. Like, you know, I get to watch, I was in the broadcast booth yesterday and, um, uh, saw like, you know, Tyler Stevenson hit a backside homer and, and, uh, TJ Friedel hit two and, and it's just like, it was like, you know, India hit a homer. And I was like, India hit a homer. That was like a ball below the zone. And it's like, from a pitcher, it's like, whoa, I, I executed my pitch right there. I was trying to throw that pitch right there. India uses this legs, gets down and drives through it. And it was just like, you just got to tip your hat in those situations. It sucks. Right. It sucks to like lose, but you're like, those guys are really good too. They are. So it's been, it's been fun to face a few of those guys. That's awesome. What What's that feeling like when you're going, you're locked in a battle with somebody and they fouled off everything and you've thrown everything. Like, what is that like knowing that like, I have not like, what am I supposed to do now? Is there a moment of like, I've thrown him everything in every spot and he's fouling it off. What am I like? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. That typically pisses me off quite a bit. Like, I don't know why I just get like super upset whenever uh, a guy starts fouling balls off. I either want to square him up right in the back or throw right down the middle and let a homer. Like I, I could care less at that point. I hate long, like 12 pitch at bats. I want to just throw it as hard as I can down the middle and punch him out or just like let him have first base. You know what I mean, like I could care less. So, um, but yeah, I like, I like really efficient outs and, and I like battling. It's fun, but gosh, man. And it's like, all right, you, who's next? You know, like you can have first base, who cares? I'll just hit this guy make them earn it a little bit and then we'll just move on to the next guy. Cause it's like, you know, some of those guys, when they start foul balls off, they really start locking in on your pitches and you're almost better off just moving on. Like hitting the guy in the ankle, shoot, like make him, make him hurt a little bit. He's not going to steal the bag. And then you just face the next guy up, you know? Are there guys that are like more prone to foul more stuff off than usual? Cause I I'm buddies with Will Crow and he said he had like a 15 pitch at bat with Freddie Freeman. And it was just like, dude, what are we doing? Like, it, have, do you have those moments with guys? Yeah, I have before. I feel like it's not often, but it definitely comes around. Yeah. I uh, I, I had some Reds questions because you mentioned your time in the broadcast booth. Um, Hunter Green, he, he's making a very strong case for Cy Young this year. He's absolutely killing it. What's been the difference for him this year, you think? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think a lot of it stems around confidence. 
Um, I mentioned that in the booth yesterday was that like him being named an all-star, I think he needed someone to like give him that accolade and like, let him know, like, you're really good. Like we all could say it, but until he like was on the all-star team and kind of earned that, um, that, that title, um, uh, that's, I think that did a lot for him. I think it did. It was really good for him to know that, how good he, he can be and he, he is, and he will be. Um, and I think that his pace has sped up a little bit, which I like. He has a little bit of more no fear on the fastball. His fastball is better this year than it was last year. It's spinning a little bit better. I've done some like more analytical deep dives on his fastball. It just has a little bit more vertical break than it did last year, which I think gives him the confidence to throw it in the zone more and not have to be so fine. I think last year he was like trying to be very fine with his fastball, like hit the corner. I have to throw my 99 in the corner. It's going to get hit. Um, and I think this year he's like, I just want to fill up the zone. And by having a little bit better pitch, it gives you more freedom to fill up the zone, which then gets you ahead of guys, gets you, you know, in, in a better uh, count. And then, you know, the numbers game says, you know, oh, one, the the hitting percentage goes down by like half. So, um, you know, he's he's winning a lot of oh, one or a lot of oh, counts. He's winning a lot of one, one counts. He's just doing the things right. And so I think those are a couple of the metrics that are really important to his success. You mentioned just like trying to throw it on the corners. I, I saw a quote from David Bell. He said Hunter's attacking guys with more conviction. Is that what it comes down to, to like not being afraid to like throw it more in the strike zone, trying to not be too fine? Because is that hard for a pitcher to also like get over that or to just like be able to throw it in the zone? Because like I wouldn't want to just throw it in the middle. Like I feel like I would want to do it on the corners, but that's also where probably guys run into trouble. So if you threw it in the middle 10 times and – you got 10 swing and misses, would you still fear throwing it down the middle? Good point. Yeah. No. So I think, I think that, um, you know, confidence comes from doing it. And so like he has more conviction of throwing the ball because he's getting better results by doing that. And now it's kind of like a correlation that's both feeding both sides. So it's like, he's throwing more strikes because he's getting more swing and misses. And now that he's getting more swing and misses, he's throwing more strikes. You know what I'm saying? So if you're, if you're trying to, nibble the zone and then every time you throw it in the zone it's a hit you're you're going to be like well i don't want to throw it in the zone so then you don't throw it in the zone as much and then it gets hit so it's kind of a, a double-sided sword on that and i think he, he's leveraging a situation he throws 100 so it's like why not let's let's go me versus you here we go i'm, I'm so glad you broke it down like that because it makes so much more sense because i always hear these quotes about yeah you, you know you have to go after guys you have to you know let it eat and i'm just like what does that mean for somebody that's never played baseball like that like that's that's that was a really good job of breaking it down um so you're you're a texas guy you've played outside in the heat um have you ever puked on the mound before no no i have not i saw him doing that the other night i was you know the heat it gets hot it's humid and you know high stress as, as well you know you're in the major league level um i've never puked i'm not a puker but some people are and he pukes a few times it's so funny man i feel bad for him he just takes some tums in between innings but you know <laughs> that's always where i'm at because i think he's done it a couple times on the mound yeah, and it's yes, like, yes. i'm like oh that's got to be so awful <laughs> that's just gonna be yeah. the worst poor guy i love hunter he's awesome he's awesome <sighs> he really so what's it like playing outside in Texas for a lot of these games growing up? And then even in the big leagues now, you're playing outside. Like how much of, of a factor is the heat for you? Yeah. When you're younger, you don't really think about it. You're like, it's hot and I'm playing. And I think once, once I got older and uh, I get outside and hot, I'm like, I'm like a little bit more of like an old man. I'm like, Oh man, it's so hot. You know, I'm sweating up a storm, but yeah, when you're younger, you don't even think about it. You're like, I got a game today. I'm going to play. And you know, the parents are sitting in the shade over there with their like fans and stuff. And, uh, you know, they get you water or whatever and like, you know, ice, uh, ice towels and stuff like that to help you, you know, stay cool. But, uh, yeah, I feel like I just playing in Texas in summer and, uh, growing up, like I just didn't really think anything of it. It was just time to go play ball. Have big leagues, uh, big league bullpens, have they gotten better about like keeping the guys cool? Cause I think like the old, like uh, ballpark in Arlington, when that was outside and like guys in the bullpen were like having to like hide under like the stuff to like try to get some shade have have bullpens gotten better about keeping guys cool yep yeah they have they have uh and keeping guys warm early in the season it's some they have uh like heaters for us and stuff out there they have fans um and some of the um bullpens that you know maybe are are less shaded than others especially during day games uh, so yeah they're doing a lot of good just stuff i think a lot of that stems from our players association where we 
you know, we want fair, you know, we don't want unfairness. You know what I'm saying? We want it, we want fairness. So it's like if the home side is getting this cool shaded area and the, the relievers are on the way team is like just getting roasted, like that's not fair, you know? So I think they went in and did some like fairness on like some stuff like that. I went in and was like, yeah, this isn't fair. That's not fair. I think the globalized stadium was like one of the most unfair. Uh, it was like, I remember I, I went on a field trip when I was like in fourth or fifth grade, we did a field trip to global live stadium and um, the the guy literally joked about how um, the away bullpen was the hottest spot in the whole uh, stadium because that was the only spot that didn't have shade. And it was like 114 degrees when it was like 100 outside. So guys were getting roasted. I mean, absolutely roasted. So, yeah, they, they do a lot. They do a lot better job there. Yeah, you're right. That's like a home field advantage for guys because, like, yeah, when the visiting team comes in, their bullpen's just going to be tired and hot and just like really miserable. Um yeah. I, I saw a clip when you were in the booth. Uh, it might have been the other day. Uh, you, you were talking about Tyler Stevenson's development as a catcher. Um, how have you seen him develop and kind of grow as a as a player as time goes on? Yeah, man, it's been cool to watch him. He's he's high attention to detail. Um, he takes his work very seriously, which is like obviously what you ask of anyone, um, right? And he just does a really good job. And every year he he shows back up to camp, and he's just like a little bit better than last year. And it's like, dang how did you get better? Like, what did you do? You know? And he just, he takes every, every moment, every practice, uh, every session very seriously. And he, he actually focuses on improving and yeah, it's been really cool. I, I threw to him. He was one, he was, I think he was the very first, like, I think I was the first pitcher to ever throw to him right when he got drafted and uh, in like the first game. And yeah, just from that moment, all the way to throwing with them in the big leagues, like it's, it's just been a complete, and then he was a first rounder too. Like, it was a first round of high school. So to be like, Oh, this guy's a first rounder and he's really good to like where he's at now. He's a really good catcher in the big leagues. Like he's improved tenfold. You know what I mean? Uh, based on whenever he first got drafted. So been really cool to watch him develop and grow not only as an athlete, but as a person as well. Awesome. You, uh, you mentioned being in the booth um, with our guy, John Sadak, he's been on here a bunch. I all right, have you gotten more comfortable being in the booth as like time has gone on? Because I've seen the the consensus online is like everybody loves your analysis, your commentary. Is that are you having fun doing that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty fun. Um, yeah, I am getting more comfortable doing it. So you know, the first time I went up there, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't say anything bad. I don't want to mess up. You know, just kind of more out of fear. And I think like after I started getting warmed up and. Um, kind of understanding the flow of the game too. So it's like, if you're starting, if you're like, you know, talking about something, being able to pause, like as something's happening on the field and like, let John explain. Cause he's like, you know, pop line or right field. He has like the really good voice for radio or TV radio, I guess. Um, but yeah. And, and, and then kind of interject where I see, and then kind of, you know, be quiet where I see you too. I think that's important because you don't want to just talk the whole time. Um, but you also want to you know give your feedback and give your thoughts on stuff. So it's a good balance. And I think, yeah, I'm starting to feel a little bit more comfortable doing it. I think it's, it might be in my, my career path, uh, after retirement. So I, you know, I want to finish playing. I want to play for five more years. I think there will be a lot of fun. And then, uh, then maybe we'll do some sort of like broadcasting coaching gig with the Reds. I think it'll be really cool. It's the best. I also like a three man booth. I, I love, cause like I watch a lot of Orioles games. They'll have like Ben McDonald and Jim Palmer and just like, having that extra guy up there to bounce stuff around from like the player's perspective with obviously you had that with Barry Larkin, like as a fan, that's the coolest thing ever. Yeah. It's a lot easier to kind of keep conversations going. Cause you don't like Barry only can talk to John, right. And John can only talk to Barry. So now that when I'm up there, they can kind of ask me questions or he can ask Barry questions and then me and Barry can have conversations, uh, keep John out of it, you know? <laughs> so it's been, it's been fun. Plus you got hitter pitcher and true, uh, you know, radio head. So, uh, it's it's a really good mix up there. I like I like working with those guys. How many times have you been back to Cincinnati like this season? Um, I this would be this is my first time I've been back. Um, I was here from all I was here whenever obviously the team got here all of April and into May, and then towards the end of May I flew home, went home for a little bit, and then. Uh, came back up here for a check with Dr. Krimchek and then I'll come back in October, get another check. And then I should be able to start doing uh, more like not throwing yet, but more like plyometric activities and then throwing shortly thereafter. It's got to be cool. Just like being back around the guys, being back a great American, I'm sure is a cool experience for you. Um, 
I think Joey Votto would like go walk around the concourse and hang out with fans. Have you gotten a chance to mix it up with the people of uh, of Cincinnati? I have not. I'm not as famous as Joey Votto. I'd li- I would like to think that they probably wouldn't even know who I was. They're like, who's this Aww. tall four guy? <laughs> um, I you know I think some people will obviously know who I am. The the real fans, but you know I'm at the same time I'm a back end reliever. Like Joey Votto's, you know, was like the face of the franchise for a long time. So I try to try to just stay in my lane and. Uh, but it's been great, like seeing the guys. I go in there. I'm a big chess head. I love playing chess, so I go in there and and try to crush everybody. Will Benson's my arch nemesis in there, so it's been fun to like. I'll face him, and like the whole team will come over and watch because it's like we're both like pretty decent at chess. Um, this time it went two and two, so we went split decision. I won two, he won two. So, uh, but it was it's fun. He's really good at chess, and it's fun kind of you know just hanging out with the guys pregame, postgame, all that stuff. And we swept the Cardinals. So, like, I mean, what's more fun than a major league clubhouse when you sweep a team? Vibes are are awesome. Uh, has Will assumed the mantle of, like, chess master in the locker room ever since Joey left? Yes. Yeah, yeah. he's definitely. He's chess master when I'm in there as well. Like, he's really good. I got to get – he's better than me. But I can I can keep up, but I can't, like, beat him. Like, you know, 12. If I had to play 10 games with him, he's he's taken six or seven for sure. That's awesome. I love these behind the scenes stories. Uh, have you kept up with Joey at all? I know he's still grinding and uh, I think he's in Buffalo triple eight with the blue, with the blue Jays. Like, have you kept up with him at all? No, I haven't. I haven't talked to Joey too much. You know, I, I watch him from afar. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't, uh, not, I'm, I'm not a really good texter. I'm like so bad at texting. I need to get better at that. Um, but yeah, just like keeping up with friends. I'm like, that's one of my downfalls is like texting people and keeping up with them. <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst at it too. Uh, I love just like, I don't think I got a chance to ask you about this last time about just anybody who's played with Joey, been around him, just like they always have these great stories where he just has like these cool one liners. Um, has he said anything to you that's like, like memorable or stood out or do you have a good, like quick Joey story? Oh man. Uh, literally the only one I can think of that I would, if I sat and thought for a while, I could think of some, but uh, the, like the only one that got me and I always just laugh about it um, is <laughs> I don't even want to tell that one, actually. I'll tell the other ones. <laughs> you got to be careful with what you say on a podcast. These things are recorded. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, did I ever tell you the story about uh, I faced Joey in spring training? I think I told you that story. I don't remember that one. Yeah. Well, I told I faced Joey in spring training. Uh, it was like a live BP in 21. I faced him and Suarez. And so we're on field one. And he... You know, I'm facing him. It's like a, you know, one, one count, two, one count, two, two, full count, like working it. And then I throw like a fastball, like maybe just maybe an inch off, like maybe, I mean, it was close. It was close. So he's like walking off, you know, like, like he had just walked. Right. And like the guys don't, they don't like run the bases in live VP. So he was like just walking back to the dugout. And I was like, Hey, like Joey, like, uh, like, do you got, was that a strike? Like, do you get that as a strike? Was that close? And he was like, I'll let you know. I'll let you know if it was a strike. And I was like, whoa, all right. Oh, I did not mean to piss you off. My bad. Um, and so, like, kind of got to me a little bit. I was like, damn, like, that was kind of a little rude. Like, all right, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little ticked off now, too. Like, kind of called me out. Just asking where it was. And so Suarez gets in the box. And I, like, I was, like, chip on my shoulder. Like, I punched Suarez out three pitches. I was, like, pissed off. Bam, bam, bam. Suarez gets out of there. Joey comes back up and now I'm like, let's go. You want to go? Let's go. And first pitch, I throw a ball and he like, he kind of does like the Soto shuffle on me. He like steps forward and he's like, ball. And I'm like, gosh, dang it. I've done piss Joey off, man. And so um, we, we continued to get bat, got to a full count again. I walked him and I was like, gosh, dang it. So I didn't say anything after that one. Cause I was like a, like a blatant walk. I like threw it, threw it away. Um, and then in the, we were like both in the gym later, he was like stretching next to me and I was like, yeah, Hey Joey, like, I didn't mean to piss you off earlier. Like, I just want to make that clear. I was just asking it. He's like, Oh, I wasn't pissed off. Like, dude, all good, man. All good. Like I'm just getting competitive. It's spring training. I'm just getting into it. I was like, Oh, okay. okay, okay. So later on in the season, um, I, I like collecting autographs and stuff. And so I bought, two Joey Votto jerseys and I was like hey Joey like 
do you mind signing one for me and like my personal collection and like signing one that I can like donate uh, to like my nonprofit and do like a, uh, like a silent auction later in season. And he was like, yeah, oh yeah, no problem at all. So he signed one just normal. And then he signed one and he wrote on there. That was probably a strike. So I have like, I have that Jersey on my wall. It says like Joey Votto. It says like, that was probably a strike and like, sick like cool story right i mean like one of a kind super you know future hall of famer i got a great story with him so um not necessarily like a one-liner from joey but you know that was probably a strike that's a one-liner it's the i i swear to god everybody that like has played on the reds that i've asked that question they always have just like the coolest stories i like dan straley has like stories for days and i think he was there for a year it was just like ah oh, god that guy's the best yeah um I used to okay, sit across I, from him on the uh, on the plane. We there's like a table on the plane. I would sit across from him and we would play chess sometimes. Really good chess player. Yeah, he would crush me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's the best. All right, I said a couple last last ones for you. Um, I noticed you're you're number seventy, right? Yeah. Was was that chosen or given to you? It was given to me, but then it ended up being chosen. They were like, oh, do you want to change numbers? And I'm like, no, this is the number you guys gave me. I want to want to rep it. Uh, seven is the number of completion in the Bible. There's seven days in a week. Um, so, you know, God rested on the seventh day. Um, and 70, the, you know, the zero after it puts you in like the higher numbers. And so in the locker room, they, uh, for spring training, they put all the locker, put all the jerseys up or put all the lockers up based on the Jersey number. So I'm in the higher area. So I usually am with the rookies, which I love. I love being with the rookies and just trying to help guide them and, and teach them everything that I wish I would have known as a rookie. Right. Um, just like all the little rules and just like being aware of this and, you know, not being late for that and just trying to help them out here and there. So uh, those are just a couple of the reasons why, you know, I feel it was given to me. It was my, my debut number. And I'm like, you know what? I like this number. It's cool. Number 70. Never have I have I've never worn 70 before making it to the big leagues and now it's my number. I like that. Yeah, usually when you see guys that stick with a higher number, there's always there's always a reason. Yeah, because I feel like the first thing guys do whenever they can get away from like number 87 is like, all right, I want like a single digit if I can. Yeah, yeah. I also thought I was like, you know, if I ever get traded or anything, no one's gonna like argue with me over number 70. <laughs> so if like a rookie has it, be like, hey, can I have number 70? You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, like, you know, whatever. So that's another reason. It's also the best part of spring training is like when the later innings happen in a spring training game, you're like, all right, we have number 97. He's facing yeah. off against 73. It's yep. just like, it's a fun, it's a fun trying to keep track of all that. Yeah. Um, uh, last question. Uh, you're, I think, are you, were you born in Oklahoma, raised in Texas? Yep. Born in Oklahoma city. Got to Texas as fast as I could. What are you a college football fan? Where does that kind of fall? Yeah. So my dad played college football at the university of Oklahoma. So he's a sooner. Um, so I grew up a Sooner fan. Um, then whenever I was in my recruiting process, my last two schools that I was between was Oklahoma and TCU. Um, I chose against Oklahoma. I chose TCU. And so I am also like a TCU fan now, but I'm still an Oklahoma fan. I like watching the football games. So I'm an Oklahoma and TCU fan. Okay. I like that. Well, yeah, Oklahoma's in the SEC now. So maybe it's not even like the big 12 rivalry anymore. I like that. And so now I can cheer on Oklahoma and, and I love like the Oklahoma, Texas rivalry. Like that's so sick. And then uh, still like be a TCU guy. Me and my wife met a TCU. So like, she's a alumni there. And uh, so we rep our purple and we rep our red. I've taken her to a few Oklahoma games. So it's, it's fun being a, if a college football fan and regardless of what team you're, you're cheering for. I love that. I'm an Oklahoma fan. So that's why I want, I was like, I feel like there's gotta be some sort of like, yeah, some Sooners in there. And you're right. The red river rivalry is like, it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah. So my dad was a 1975 national championship uh, or champion. Uh, so he has a, he has a national championship ring and I mean, dude, pretty cool. Huh? I mean, you, you, you're a, you're a Sooner and you're a national champion, like sick, really cool. That's the best can't yep. wait for college football I keep looking at the schedule um yep. okay that tj this has been incredible uh oh your your kova sports I, your instagram page is always doing really cool stuff you're training people down there in texas where can people find out more about your information about what you guys have going on yeah so i would just say check out our instagram it's uh kova sports tx.com and that's k-o-v-a sports if you can't spell that with tx we're in texas so um and you know that's our instagram handle too kova sports tx um 
yeah, it's a, it's a really fun business and, and we're doing our best to help guys get to the next level, maximize potential. Um, we've helped over 80 athletes uh, get to the college level and get a college scholarship. And we've only been open for, this is our fourth year. So, I mean, we're still a young company and we've done really cool things. Uh, working with pro guys, working with youngsters, we do remote training. Um, you can go to my page, it's, you know, TJ Antone, it's spelled a little funny, it's T-E-J-A-Y uh, Antone, if you want to check that out. But yeah, it, that, that's uh, that's kind of everything I got. Man, this is the best. Thank you so much for your time, and, and best of luck with your recovery and your rehab and everything going forward. Thank you. appreciate it. Thank you so much.